we felt like we kind of stumbled upon it. You know, we never intended to start a business. We just figured out that we could do this. And that was when we had that first meeting with you and said, hey, I think this could be a thing. You know, you've you've done this so many times and advised so many companies. What do you think? We would show up at a restaurant and we would say, hey, we have this idea. And they would, if they would kick us out, oh, idea didn't work. Okay, let's try again. Hey, we're working on a project. We were just going door to door, asking people what they thought of this as an idea. So we literally, we were still working full-time jobs and we would just spend our nights and weekends going, knocking on restaurant doors, calling people who worked in the Food and Drug Administration that we just found their numbers online and saying, hey, we're, we, we have this thought. What do you think? Welcome back to The Men. Mentors. This is Vadim and Sergey, and this is a show where we tell stories of ordinary people that became extraordinary entrepreneurs despite lack of experience, money, or connections. And today we have a special guest. Well, I guess special for me because I really have always loved working with this founder. I've known her for a while. Uh, this is Christine Schindler of Pathspot. She is the founder and CEO of this company. And Christine and I met, I guess it was like a year and a half ago or so when this was just an idea, right? It was just an idea. <laughs> <laughs> just an idea. And you have gone such a long way in just the last year and a half that I'm really excited to tell this story. Pathspot is a hardware and software product that helps detect uh, well, actually, you know what? I'm going to let you pitch it, actually, because I'm, I'm going to be bad at describing it because I haven't had to pitch it in about a year and a half. <laughs> but but I, w- I do want to say that before you tell me what the company is about, which is a product that you guys sell to restaurants, but you have been featured on Business Insider, on TechCrunch. You uh, recently went through the Techstars program, a very competitive accelerated program here in New York City, just fresh off of raising a few million dollars here and have several customers now. And this is all just in the last year and a half. So very exciting traction in just the year, last year and a half. But why don't you give us the quick 10 second pitch of what the product actually does? Absolutely. So PathSpot is a system for protecting food service companies and their customers from the threat of foodborne illness by scanning employees' hands to see if they have any harmful contamination that could make someone sick, like E. coli, salmonella, neurovirus, hepatitis A, listeria, you know, all those things that you don't want when you go out to eat. Mm -hmm. And then we aggregate that data from those locations and give it to management teams so that they can see any gaps they have in their sanitation procedures, and they can use it to customize trainings and create a positive culture around sanitation for their establishments. Very cool. Uh, I First of all, I can't believe that this hasn't existed before. Like, I, I feel like restaurants should be mandated to have this. But anyway, that's a conversation for another time. But... That sounded like a really polished pitch, by the way. Yeah, so you've clearly, done you've gone a very long. <laughs> <laughs> was how good was it a year and a half ago when, when uh, they were pitching it at the VFA uh, accelerator? A year and a half ago, Christine's co-founder Dutch came to me actually, and we met at a coffee shop down the street on Seventh on Seventh Street, and he basically showed me a picture of this thing that he thought would attach to a phone that you could scan a surface of anything and it would show you if there's any uh, contaminants or bacteria or anything like that on it. And he's like, this is a really cool thing. It has so many potential applications. Hospitals should be using it. Restaurants should be using it. It should be everywhere because we need to know what's on our surfaces. And I thought, okay, pretty cool. You're not gonna be able to sell it that way. So what are some ways that you can figure out a market for this? And Christine, can you tell us what happened? Because in that conversation, Dutch and I narrowed a potential application for this. We realized that maybe selling to hospitals is a little bit too much of a lift that uh, might be hard to do in the beginning when you're still validating a concept. And a hardware product is notoriously difficult to not only produce, but sell as well. So restaurants seemed like a better potential market What did you guys do after that meeting? Because you accomplished a lot in a short period of time. Yeah, during that meeting, it's so funny to think back on that. Uh, We literally had a bunch of wires taped to a dinner plate. It's funny that you say that it should, it's something that you feel like should already exist because that's actually what we thought at the beginning too. When we wanted to create this and we had the idea, our original thought was that we could partner with a company that was already doing instantaneous detection of foodborne illness on surfaces. And we, when we couldn't find 
absolutely anyone who was doing it. That's when we decided to create it ourselves. And first version was literally us just going to Radio Shack, uh, going out of business sale, buying a lot of electronic components and working in our basement, starting to iterate algorithm that could be able to indicate for those illnesses. And we felt like we kind of stumbled upon it. You know, we never intended to start a business. We just figured out that we could do this. And that was when we had that first meeting with you and said, hey, I think this could be a thing. You know, you've you've done this so many times and advised so many companies. What do you think? And it was really through other conversations like that one that helped us figure out what that target market should be. You know, I think that for the first few months, all we did was go around to people who had either scaled companies in the healthcare space or in the food service space and asked their advice on what the process was like in, in getting a technology like this to market. And then simultaneously, we were just going door to door asking people what they thought of this as an idea. So we literally, we're still working full-time jobs and we would just spend our nights and weekends going, knocking on restaurant doors, calling people who worked in the Food and Drug Administration that we just found their numbers online and saying, hey, we're, we, we have this thought, what do you think? And when people started telling us that they'd been waiting 10 years for a product like this and that they also couldn't believe that no one had developed this before, that's when we decided to uh, quit our jobs and go full time on PathSpot. Well, wow. but what I love about what you guys did is, I mean, yeah, clearly you had the technical background to put something like this together, tinker in the basement and actually test to see if it works. But then once you had an, a version of it that worked, and I, I do want to find out about a little bit about that, how'd you know that it worked? What made you confident enough to actually pick up the phone and do the door-to-door walking? Because so many brilliant people think of brilliant ideas, but they don't actually take the next step, which is talking to customers, actually seeing if people see value in what it is that you built. Yeah, so we both studied biomedical engineering and that's kind of how we had the technical background, but we had absolutely no idea how to run a business. Both of us had been very focused in lab work and the medical space. Even in our full-time jobs, we were both very focused in the medical space. And that's why in the same time that we were going out and asking people for advice who were actually in the space, we were talking to other people who had built this before and asking them, you know, how did you do this? You had an idea for all these different types of products that were completely completely different than ours. And how did you make that first step? And every single person told us that the first thing to do was just start having conversations. You know, we heard it from Sergey, we heard it from <laughs> friends who had started companies, we heard it from people who had scaled businesses. And that made us, you know, have the courage to decide to go out and just ask the question. We'd also started a nonprofit organization when we were in college. And that was a great way to try out also, you know, this entrepreneurial mindset. And even though starting something as a student is different than starting something full time, that experience also gave us a lot of confidence in knowing that we had created something from nothing before. And even though engineering is very, can, can seem like it's all very technical, I think that the engineering mindset of something doesn't exist, there's a problem in the world, you need to build something that solves it and you need to get it out there. That was something that we really learned while we were studying engineering together in school, while we were working in our labs, and we were then able to kind of take that same mindset with different principles in the business world and, and definitely pour it over and uh, expand it there. And a few, just a few months later, the two of you were accepted to participate in the Venture for America Accelerator. Uh, and we've talked about VFA a lot on the show. But I think you made it clear, at least to me at that point, that you were going to be serious about this as a business. And part of the reason, honestly, why we accepted you is because I think it was just two weeks after we had that initial meeting where you guys hadn't really had that many conversations before, at least with potential customers. You had gone, I think it was like 80 door-to-door -door conversations with restaurant owners. Now, you're pretty outgoing. I, I know that. But... That was the first time you ever had to sell or pitch something, and especially pitching something where you don't necessarily have a product yet. Do you remember what it was that you said when you walked in the door, like how you asked to meet the right person, and then once you met that person, do you remember what you said to them? Oh, we were terrified. We had absolutely no idea, and I think what was funny was that it changed every single time. So we would show up at a restaurant and we would say, hey, we have this idea. And they would if they would kick us out. Oh, idea didn't work. OK, let's try again. Hey, we're working on a project. Just continuously iterate every time it was a different statement. Every time we kind of had this giant hodgepodge spreadsheet and my co-founder and I were working in different cities. So we were able to test this out in different places. What 
people responded to in Manhattan wasn't the same thing that people responded to in Cleveland. And so we were able to start figuring out what got us in the door, what started a conversation. A lot of times we'd order something. It felt like if we just sat down and ordered a cup of coffee and started up a casual conversation with whoever was helping us at the restaurant location, that was a great way to get in the door. We joined loyalty programs. <laughs> Everyone there had things that they needed on their docket too. So I remember one restaurant location was like trying to meet their goal of people who joined the loyalty program. We were going around the restaurant being like, hey, sign up for the loyalty program. <laughs> also, can we ask you some questions about foodborne illness? So I think it's really, there wasn't a formula. It was just doing whatever it took to get the right answers to the right questions and then going one step forward and just always asking one more question. Mm. And in the beginning days too, we were also looking a lot at what food tech events were there and where we could meet these customers outside of just their standard restaurant locations. So then we'd find a conference or a food show and they'd say, it's a $500 entrance fee. And we'd call up the organizers and say, can we take out the garbage? Can we volunteer to set up tables at the beginning? We'd love to just be in the room, just joining the conversation and things like that also really helped us just keep getting answers to the questions. Wow, that, that's really resourceful and I think should be inspiring for a lot of people that are kind of banging their heads against the walls thinking that, oh, I don't have the advantages that other people have. I don't have the resources or the money or the connections. How do I actually get my foot in the door? Here you guys were going out there, meeting with people, but doing a few things. First of all, offering value where you can. Second of all, making sure that you're actually building relationships. And thirdly, once you already are there and already doing the hard work of getting through the door, adding value, building the relationship, you're making sure that you're continuing to push and asking one more question because you never know when it's a question that'll spark some kind of interest or ignite some kind of uh, deep conversation with the person you're talking to that'll then result in an introduction or a commitment to try out your product or whatever it is and actually, again, get you closer to your ultimate goal. So then what was kind of the first indicator that you have something interesting or was it somebody that said, okay, we want to try it out. Can we install this in our restaurant? What was kind of the first hint of this might work? At the beginning, it was definitely people just saying, just willing to be continue the conversation with us and telling us that this was a problem. At first, you start talking to people and they'd say, oh no, we have no issues with foodborne illness. But then all of a sudden, they're like, yeah, we've been out of soap for three weeks and nobody's been washing their hands <laughs> and we're really nervous. Which restaurant is that? <laughs> <laughs> Not that. one that we're working with. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I think that it started with us really unraveling that this was something that was very on the forefront of people's minds. And as we got deeper into those conversations, kept asking that one more question, we had restaurant owners telling us that this was the thing that kept them up all night, every night. And simultaneously, it was in the news every day. And I think moments when we felt like we were so overcome with anxiety and worry, what's going to be next? One of the things we did is we set up a notification to our phones to beep every time a foodborne illness incident was reported in the news. Hmm. And that little piece of reminder, hey, I'm working on something that matters. I'm working on something that's a problem. I'm working on something that's really making someone sick was sometimes enough to keep us going. And, um, you know, I'd be in investor meetings. They'd be like, what is going on with your phone? I was like, it's beeping every time there's a foodborne illness issue. See, it's a really big wow. problem. That's but cool. it kind of kept us going as well. And when it comes to getting someone to first try the product, though, we, we got turned down. Everyone was telling us, yeah, this is a huge problem. No, we don't want your unit. <laughs> wow. I think that was a whole nother, a whole nother barrier to overcome. And a lot of people said that it was impossible to quickly iterate with hardware. You have to have a software product to quickly iterate. And software, they were saying how it was such a great deal because you could just change the app and try something new. And we decided that we didn't want hardware to be a barrier and we felt like there were tools at our disposal to get there. So we got a 3D printer in the VFA accelerator. Yes. And yes. Sergey will tell you, we used it constantly. I mean, we would 3D print something. We were like, the first thing we have to do is make something, anything, because people would say, well, what's it look like? And we'd say, oh, you know, what do you think it should look like? And that's just a dark hole. <laughs> so we just 3D printed something. It was like a little case that clipped on to a tablet and we went out and we got a tablet and we just started carrying around and saying, this is the thing. Do you want to use it? And then they would say, no, I don't want to use that. And we're like, well, why? They'd say, oh, well, I really wish it mattered on a wall. So then we would stay up all night with the 3D printer. We named it. We were with it all the time. <laughs> Literally, Sergey will tell you, sleeping on the floor next to the 3D printer so that we could change it. And we'd 3D print a new version and we'd show up again the next day, same restaurant. And we'd say, hey, it mounts on the wall. 
And then they, do you want to use it now? And they'd say, well, no, it doesn't do this, or it doesn't look like this, or it doesn't have this feature. And then we'd be like, okay, stay tuned. <laughs> and we just kept doing that every single day until finally someone said, I'll put it on the wall for an hour. Mm-hmm. I'll give you one hour of feedback. I still don't really like it. I still don't think it's perfect yet, but I'll give you one hour with it. Mm-hmm. And then we're like, great. But we made our goal getting someone to looking at, at it, getting someone to give us one piece of constructive feedback, getting someone to put it on the wall for one hour, because each of the sessions of feedback that we got from those experiences is what has made us figure out what to build today. That's huge. And I do remember that first version. And, you know, it's something that I tell entrepreneurs all the time now. Hardware does actually seem pretty intimidating, but no matter what you're building, there's no substitute for a visual representation of what you're building. In the beginning, it's okay if it's just literally on a website or an image or a 3D rendering. But the next step is having a physical version of it, which is what you guys did with the 3D printer. We were lucky enough where we could actually purchase that so you guys could use it and much print something. 3D, 3D printer that we had at VFA, I think it was like $2,000. Okay. Uh, but obviously well worth it because for one of our companies that we invested in, it was it ended up helping you create a prototype yeah, you that you could can, sell with. You can right? get them now for as little as $400 yeah, well. that are fully functioning yeah. or you could find a makerspace somewhere yeah. and join the makerspace and and they'll let you use it for a small monthly fee or sometimes even for free if you're a startup so there is always a way to create a visual version of your product and nothing is a substitute because people react to things that are visual and you did that and it sounds like you iterated on it and i i definitely remember those dinky versions in the beginning but they were real and i actually thought it was pretty cool when i saw the first one because it looked legit and it worked more importantly so i guess with all of this iteration that you did while you were in that initial accelerator program for the first time doing the business full time, what did you do to actually then get your first paying customer? Because, okay, getting somebody to use it for an hour is great. You can use that to inform the product decisions that you're making, but you don't want to be making all your product decisions based on unpaid customers. So how did you close that first deal? It was a combination of just continuously getting people to put it on their, you know, on their wall for an hour and then a day and then a week. And then, you know, and then all of a sudden we're saying, hey, you've got it up there for a week. What do you think a fair price is? So I think those initial iterations really helped us determine what people would pay, Mm. what it would be used for and helped us craft a narrative so that when we went out to the market and said, hey, we've got this thing when we're again, setting up tables at food shows so that we can have an opportunity to present at them, we had a better idea of what was the range of products that people paid for something like this. We talked to so many founders of companies that sell to restaurants. And I think that that's that was one of the most impactful things for our business is that we got continuous advice from people who were selling totally different products are other founders and a lot of times when you would go to a restaurant and say hey can i have your advice they were like i don't want to be sold to but if you went to another founder who had started a company and said hey i really admire what you've built i really also want to be in this space i've never done anything in this before can i have 10 minutes of your time to get your feedback almost every single restaurant tech founder said yes. Hmm. And I say yes now when someone reaches out to me with that request because entrepreneurs really want other people to be entrepreneurs and want there to be more innovation and in all these different spaces and are passionate about it. So from those conversations of people giving us real insight into what does the sales process look like? What does it feel like? Who should you be asking for at the restaurant? Those were really the things that began to dictate our whole sales process. And then in building relationships with those founders, you know, after a period of time that we were continuous getting their feedback and also trying to add value to them wherever we could, even so little things of like, we'll 3D print you a logo of your company (laughs) as a thank you present for your time. By the end of building a real relationship and friendship with them, oftentimes they were the ones introducing us to their customers Mm. and saying, hey, this person sells a totally different product than me. But that warm intro, that you know, that connection to to someone who's already done this and already is in this space and already has this network and has built a product and has um, successfully launched that product. Those are our biggest advocates and hopefully we're the biggest advocates for them too. So that's how we got all of our first customers. Wow, that's awesome. And were you too worried about 
what the costs are and how much margin you need and how much that should affect pricing or is it mostly sensitivity to what the customer that you were speaking to was willing to pay? Oh, we were terrified <laughs> of all of those things, mostly because we didn't know. But we also recognized that at this really early stage, I mean, we we were still building things with 3D printers. They still had tons of maintenance issues. We recognized that our early customers really deserved a a different price point than customers are going to receive now. And so we were very much open to a conversation of how we can make this a mutually beneficial, almost more of a partnership than a sales process. And we still approach all of our customers in that we know that we can gain as much insight from them into how we can improve our product. So we try to make it as affordable as possible. Are you still doing a lot of the sales or all of the sales for the business? I mean, I feel like we're all still doing everything. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Someone that we were interviewing the other day asked like how the organization was structured. And I was like, (laughs) "Uh, you know, it's pretty flat. (laughs) We all do a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I think that right now at this size of our company, it's really important for everyone who's on the team to be involved in everything because we're really just trying to figure out where the holes are. So it doesn't matter like, you know, yesterday night we were there at midnight screwing a device onto the wall to understand what does it feel like to screw a device on the wall? What's hard about it? What's easy about it? What's going to make this difficult for someone when we ship out a thousand of these units in a couple months? We can't know that without really being involved and really being on the ground. So we're definitely, we have our hands in everything and we're really thinking critically about what do we need to bring this next step to scale? I'm curious, um, you know, obviously you're very entrepreneurial. You said you started a nonprofit in college. And so that's probably something that you've been interested in for a while. But as somebody that's coming from an engineering background, somebody that likes to tinker, I'm assuming, and build, what has been the most interesting part about building your own company? Because you wear so many hats, there's so many things you have to do. Some of them, I'm sure you don't love doing. So what do you say the most interesting, exciting part of what you're doing day to day? Yeah, and it's funny to to think of myself as entrepreneurial because I never intended to start anything. If you had asked me even a few years ago, do you think you'll ever start a business? I would have said definitely not. I think that really the internal drive for me comes from when there's a gap in the world that needs to be solved and I have the capability to solve it, then I feel a real responsibility to be able to put everything I have into filling that gap. And that's what happened with our nonprofit organization which focuses on getting more women interested in STEM fields and what happened again with PathSpot. And I think that really ties into my favorite part about my role with PathSpot now is just continuously getting to ask the questions, that one more question, whether it's from a customer, from an investor, from an employee, from a team member, what is the next thing that we're missing? What could we be doing better? What could we be doing to make this more impactful? And then trying to work backwards from that to figure out what the solution is. And so it, it, it kind of does play into all those different hats, but my favorite part of my day is when I just get to sit with my team and ask the big questions about what's working and what's not. And we feel you know so fortunate being so agile that we can just dive in and fix it. When you were working at a job, I can't imagine that you worked as hard as you do now because I've seen how hard you and Dutch work. A uh, hundred hour weeks easy. I don't know if you still do that, but <laughs> we definitely uh, <laughs> still do that. Uh, and and so because it's so difficult, and you didn't see you didn't see yourself as an entrepreneur when you wake up every day, and when you're staying up late. I mean, sometimes I'm sure it gets to you. How do you get yourself past, let's say, uh, the difficult times where maybe it does feel like something's really hard to do or maybe you want you want to give up i don't know if you've had that feeling that you want to give up because you guys have had wins and momentum which i think has kept kept you going but if entrepreneurship wasn't the thing that you thought you were going to do it seems like it's natural to you now when i look at you when i talk to you how do you reconcile that I think that everyone has that feeling of, you know, am I going to be able to keep going one more day, one more minute, one more hour? And I think the thing that really gets me through it is conversations like this, conversations with either people who have done this before or even people who are doing it right alongside you. I had coffee with another founder today and I was like, how's life? And he just said, running a business is hard. (laughs) And I laughed because it seems so simple, but I feel that every day. And so I think there's an incredible community and camaraderie around this. And I'm really fortunate that I'm surrounded by a lot of different networks of people who are willing to sit and listen to the biggest challenges in my day. And I love hearing the biggest challenges in theirs. And we try to troubleshoot it together. And so I think I wouldn't be able to get through it without 
calling those other founders, either from the VFA Accelerator or from Techstars or from our alma mater, or from so many different networks that I've met in the city. And I feel like anytime I pick up the phone and I'm having one of those moments, I can hear from an investor, an advisor, a friend, a mentor, a colleague, you know, hey, we've all felt this and we're, we can get through it together. I think that a few things you said are really important to consider. One of the messages that we tried to, I think, get across in this show or with this show is that entrepreneurship is hard and entrepreneurship is kind of a buzzword now, right? I mean, there's a reason why shows like Silicon Valley got really popular. It's because it seems really cool to be able to raise millions of dollars as a young kid and in some characters in that show, I guess, get to spend that money however they want. But that's not really the reality. <laughs> the reality is hard work and 100 hour weeks and feeling sometimes like the world's collapsing around you, feeling sometimes like, why am I even doing this? Sometimes having relationships they get hurt from it. But I think the reason why every entrepreneur that we have on the show and the reason why me and Sergey have always been interested in this topic and interested in building businesses is because nothing beats the positive feelings that come from it as well. Because it can also be incredibly rewarding and you can't repeat that rewarding feeling doing anything else except for creating something out of nothing. And I, what you just said is actually a great segue to a new segment that we want to try out because we are called The Mentors. One question that we haven't asked enough of our guests is... I'd be curious to hear if you can think through, it sounds like you have a lot of mentorship relationships right now with both founders, investors, advisors. Can you think of a recent conversation that you might have had with a mentor and some advice that they gave you that really stuck with you that was really helpful in that moment? Our mentors are the backbone of the company. You know, I think when I think through where we were a year and a half ago, we would be nowhere without the generosity and the time of so many people. And I think that the, the, well, the question I always ask to every time I have a mentor meeting and I say, you know, what is the thing that I'm missing? Because I think that we get so in the weeds with our company because you're doing it all the time and it's all you think about that there could be some big glaring hole that someone else with more experience and more understanding of a certain topic, that's the thing that they most see. And so I think the best advice I've gotten is just to keep asking that question and not feel embarrassed or shy with the problems that are going on in the company because it's it's really easy for everyone to say like, oh, you're killing it, everything's mm -hmm. great. And on the surface, sure, everything is great and, and everything is going really well. I'm very confident about the next steps in, of the company and I'm really excited to deliver on them. But simultaneously, there's a lot of things that I'm worried about and that I wanna figure out how to work through. And so one of the best pieces of advice I always get from mentors I really trust is to be transparent about those worries and those fears and to be honest about them because that's the only way that you can work through them and, and figure out how to solve them. Would you be open to sharing maybe what a recent worry has been or maybe when you've asked that question recently, what the answer has been, what am I missing? Yeah, I think one of the things right now for us is we've recently closed a seed round and neither Dutch or I has ever grown a team before. So the process of hiring and who to hire and when to hire for all different roles is something that we haven't done in our past jobs. Fortunately, many people have done that and have done that expansively and have grown incredible teams. And so some of the advice that I've gotten when I when I bring up that worry is people not only diving in to help us figure out our pipeline, but diving in to help us conduct interviews, letting us listen in on interviews that they're conducting for the company, wow. but because they have great expertise with being able to figure out who might be a good fit. Also sharing the job posting with you know their friends and, and their networks and being willing to sit down with us and look through resumes and point out red flags or point out things that are really exciting. And so I think that I've brought that worry to so many people and they've not only given advice but dove in and sat with me through the process and whiteboarded out what a good pipeline would look like for different hires recruiting pipeline now it sounds like you're really good at asking people for help how do you do that like do you sit there 7 p.m every night and text people with a specific question do you do it opportunistically as like questions come up and you know who to go to like how do you actually ask for help or decide when to do it and how I think it's a mix of both. I do sit uh, at night and think about, okay, what are the things that are rolling through my head that I'm terrified of? 
they're just gonna stay in there and get make it so that I can't sleep if I don't get it out there. And I will just text people and say, hey, can you open the phone for 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. I would really love to pick your brain about something. And I think it creates really cool relationships because then they are willing to do the same thing for me. And sometimes things that you're spinning on for hours are really simple to someone who's done it a hundred times before. Mm. And I think the other thing that we are very adamant about is that we really want to continuously engage our network, especially people who are invested in the company. And it can be hard when you have so many different investors and there's so many different people who work for an investment group. And so one thing that we do is every month we send out an update email. It just has three bullets of of successes, three bullets of failures, three bullets of general like updates or things that are going on in the company and three bullets of really critical asks. What are the things that are burning on our mind? And sometimes people have huge networks of expertise that you didn't even know about and they'll respond to me like, oh yeah, that's actually something I can hop on the phone with you about right now. So the end of the month is one of my favorite times because we really get to leverage and see that happen. And I send out this giant mess email into people's inboxes and within 20 minutes I've got a hundred replies of people saying I can help you with your ask so I think really thinking through the ask and being very you don't want it to be too big you don't want to ask for help and just say help how do I scale that's not anything that anyone's gonna feel related to but if you say like I'm worried about my this one supply chain issue and we've done XYZ and this is the next step and we're not sure how to get there. It really jogs people's memories. And even if they don't know how to help, a lot of times they'll say, oh, my friend, my colleague, I've got the perfect person for you to talk to. And then you add that person to the list. So (laughs) suddenly you just are continuously expanding who is in your network to help. Yeah, when you're working on something really interesting and new and innovative, and you mentioned yourself, uh, one of the things that motivates you is you identified this gap. And if you feel like you can bring that value to the world, that's what keeps you going. But when other people see that you're working on it, see that you're making traction, and they become part of, I guess, your tribe that's coming along for the ride, they actually love to be engaged and they love to be useful as well. People love being useful because, again, they're excited about what you're working on. And if they can help, it's great. That's why we mentor entrepreneurs as well. If we feel like we can be helpful, we'll do it every single time. It's the times where you get an email or an ask that's too broad, like you said, or where you think, hey, I'm not the relevant person at all for you. Why are you reaching out to me? That's where it gets a little bit frustrating too. So I think the way that you're managing these relationships is really it was really good. And that what you mentioned about every single month, keeping people updated on your progress, keeping people updated with what the actual immediate ask is right now is a really great way to do it. So you're going to have done it in the past and recommend it for anybody that is managing a bunch of relationships and is trying to figure out how do we actually to keep people engaged consistently. And if even if someone can't help that month, they feel like they're, like you said, along for the journey, they know the updates of what's happening, they can talk about it to their friends or their colleagues, and then a couple months later, when you have an ask that is very relevant to them, they don't feel like, oh, but I have to go all the way back, I don't even remember what was going on with this company. It's really easy for you to just pick up relationships, and we also always end all those emails with if there's anything we can do to help you. Because I think that then there's times where where someone's looking for something that's exactly what we're able to help mm-hmm. with. And that's one of my favorite parts is when these mentor relationships can really go both ways and you're able to help a mentor, a mentor is helping you, and it's it's really exciting to see how we can all push each other forward. A year and a half later, you as a company are in definitely a different place than when you were, when you first came to me, of course, uh, needless we're to say. We're in a different place every day. <laughs> every day. Every, there you go. Every day you're in a different place. You you have a team, I believe six uh, people now on your team. You're no longer selling to just single locations. In fact, you're uh, selling right now to restaurants with thousands of locations, which is pretty cool. And you no longer have a 3D printed (laughs) device. You just came back from a trip to China. You decided to pack your bags and go over the holidays so that you could uh, get a handle on the supply chain. And I know you're changing every day, so maybe it's a little bit difficult to answer, but what have you changed in your sales process now that you're a little bit more mature as a company and also in your supply chain process that you've had to fine tune because I remember that was a big source of anxiety for you last year. Yeah, it's it's a really great question and I think that I'm constantly having to reflect on where we've been and also where we're going and shift the narrative accordingly. I mean, I think that a year ago, our sales process was very much me going out and saying, hey, we've got this idea, take a chance on us, we're scrappy, just trying something out, like 
please, we'll, we will, we'll work with you. We'll do anything. And I think now we've really refined who our target customer is, what type of customers are the best fit for the success of the product. And it's given me confidence to now shift our narrative and say, you know, we're a company that's almost two years old. We've got, we're venture backed. We've got a team behind us. Unfortunately, we won't make that request or we won't change our unit to fit this need or we won't sell to that group that isn't the right target market for us. And so I think that the only way that we can do that is by reflecting. We have a weekly meeting where we just sit and talk about, hey, what happened this week and and how did that make us feel? You know, what what were the things this week that really didn't go well? And was it because it wasn't the right customer? Was it because it wasn't the right target? Was it because it wasn't the right device? What is it that we need to shift to make sure that we're setting ourselves up for the most success possible? And I think narrowing is the biggest difference. A year ago, we would take anything, you know, because we were just trying to learn. And through those conversations, through pilots, through so many different people giving us feedback, we're now fortunate that we have a more directed, hey, this is what works and this is how we're going to start scaling. And then simultaneously on the side, we're like, hey, but wouldn't it be cool to try that out? Like, Mm -hmm. okay, and we almost bucket it separately. This is the path that we know is working. Let's keep going on that. Let's keep refining. Let's keep getting closer to the target. And simultaneously, hey, let's try out this thing over here. Just like see what would happen if we added in this feature. And we're really lucky to have so many people that are that are really on our team from a customer perspective as well that want to be in both those different avenues. And you did mention really briefly that now you're trying to figure out how to scale because you have refined sort of who your target customer is. And uh, you, you mentioned that maybe you're getting ready to ship a couple thousand units now, which is obviously getting to scale. So talk a little bit about your trip to China, because I think a lot of people are going to be curious about how does somebody even figure out the manufacturing process to go from, oh, wait, now there's interest. I have to be ready for when somebody actually places the order. I think that's one of the hardest parts about being a hardware company and also what helps you create a really incredible moat. So it's definitely a double-edged sword. So once we figured out that we were building these units with you know, 3D printed pilots and a lot of these chain restaurant locations were asking us when we could get it to expand into all of their locations, you know, that's a very different scale and we can't just go and, and repair them when the 3D print material gives out. <laughs> we need it to be something that's going to be way more sustainable. And we started having conversations with so many different manufacturing groups, internationally, domestically, right next door, across the whole country, trying to figure out what was going to be the fastest way to get our product in into as many hands as possible. And I think, you know, sometimes as entrepreneurs, we can also be very idealistic. Yeah, it's going to be really inexpensive and it's also going to be sourced really locally. So there'll be no lag time. And also all the shipping is going to be perfect, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think what we ended up realizing again, through support of incredible mentors is that you have to really make trade-offs in the supply chain process. And so we had a giant spreadsheet again kind of back to the beginning just like we were when we were trying to figure out customers where we were asking all these questions to so many different groups and trying to figure out okay what works what doesn't work and in the end we realized that we needed something quickly to fill our gap in our supply chain and we also recognize that not being able to do things in person puts a lot of lag on the time that something is able to move forward so we said you know when is a really low volume time in the US for from a business perspective is over the holidays. You know what holiday isn't celebrated in China, (laughs) like Western New Year. So we just flew over New Year's and we just went door to door to manufacturing facilities with our PowerPoint, showing them what we're building so far with our prototype 3D printed, putting it in front of them and saying, what would you change? Again, asking those questions, what's going to make it easier to manufacture? What's going to make it less expensive? Different questions, but on Honestly, very similar to those early stages and and back to that phase of just continuously asking one more question until someone said, you know, we could make you 50 units. Mm -hmm. We could make you 100 units. Sure, we'll make you 2,000 units. And I think showing up and really putting yourself out there, especially when we didn't have a network, never built a product before, you know, what's going to make someone really listen is the same as showing up at the restaurants and being bought in was showing up at the manufacturing facilities and 
touring and talking to their staff and asking them how we could get it to the next level. Did you say you went to Shenzhen to start? Yes, we did. We were, we were all around Shenzhen. And at the end of our conversations, we'd say, you know, is there anyone else you think we should meet with? Maybe we weren't a good fit for you. Why not? Who else can we talk to? And so we were, we, we were in all different cities, Guangzhou, Guan, Guangdong, as well as in Hong Kong. So we, yeah, we were all over the place. Is Shenzhen one of the, like the manufacturing capitals of China? It is. Okay. Yeah, it is. And we were fortunate to be able to hire some people there to help us navigate it. I don't think I would have known where to go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't speak Chinese, unfortunately, so we did have a translator. Well, it sounds like you're very comfortable in the ambiguity of problem or a question being posed in front of you and then figuring out the best next steps and jumping into action to get an answer. Uh, That's why you employed those tactics last year. And now when you had a problem to solve, you did exactly the same thing. And I'm excited to see what happens as you guys scale pathspottech.com. That's still your website? Yes. (laughs) pathspottech.com. If you're a restaurant owner... And you don't have one of these scanning devices to tell me if you or to tell you (laughs) if your employees hands are dirty when they're coming when they're handling food, please, for the sake of all of us, invest in one of these devices. I'm going to be looking at your restaurant to see if it's there. (laughs) Uh, And thank you so much for bringing this product to market. It was very intimidating in the beginning, but you and your co-founder Dutch figured it out. And I'm just so excited about what the future holds for you. Christine Schindler, thank you so much for coming on The Mentors. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And hopefully there's going to be a consumer version because I also (laughs) kind of want to know right now what's going on. (laughs)